We're glad you're here this morning. And um, yeah, this morning uh, God has put a, a message on my heart and it, it falls in line with the, um, the series that we've been going through in the book of 1 John. And, and um, I'm going to continue our series in the book of 1 John. Thank, I'm thankful that John Kendrick could uh, fill in for me last week. It was a great week. I got a whole bunch of stuff done at home and I had a nice break. So that was really awesome. Um, but we're going to continue in our series in the book of 1 John. And... Um, as I mentioned uh, several weeks ago when I was speaking to you about this particular book, that John the Apostle has placed a great deal of emphasis on things that are key to living a life that is filled with truth, meaning, and purpose. And in essence, when we look at um, 1 John, we see a formula that is given to the people of the church for living a life in harmony with God and with others. And the whole crux of the matter is that our faith is not merely um, a, a tradition. It's not merely a pattern of doing things, but it is, actually, it is actually a relational thing. It's a relationship that we have. And sometimes you know, people look at us funny when they say, well, I'm not religious. I am um, I'm a believer, and I, and I have a relationship with God. And some people scratch their heads because they don't really get it from the outside. But when you come to truly know the living God, He is alive. And the Spirit of the living God lives within my heart, within my spirit. And this is the, the book of 1 John comes to the very focal point of what's important in the Christian life. Christian meaning Christ-like one from that perspective, the heart that is given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. So our text this morning is 1 John chapter 3. I'll be preaching from verses 11 to 24. And I'll be talking to you this morning about the nature of God's love. So in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, the Apostle John says this. He says, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. And in the word, world of true believers in Jesus Christ, from the very beginning of the foundations of the church, if you look back in the Scriptures, you look at the Gospels and how Jesus walked with His apostles, into the early church through the book of Acts and all the teachings that happen in the epistles and in the, and the books of the New Testament. We look at this and, and we see that God was interested in dealing with the heart of humanity, which was laden by sin, which was selfish and separated from Him and distant from Him. And that very nature of brokenness and selfishness lends itself not only to brokenness and distance between us and our relationship with our Creator, but it also brings with it a brokenness with our relationship to one another. So here John is saying that we should love one another. So Jesus came into this world for the sake of love. He came to this world to show us the true nature of the love of God, calling us to be reconciled to Himself, giving Himself as a sacrificial offering so that we could have oneness with God and could be brought back into a relationship with our Creator that was broken because of our sin. And through the forgiveness of sin and the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The church was called to be an imitator of Christ in His love for us by genuinely, genuinely loving one another. So this message is given to us by John and the other apostles. And, and if you look at it, it is the very core of all Christian practice, or it ought to be. It's not always that way. But it ought to be. When it's not, we're askew. We're away from where God intends us to be. The world does not understand the love of God. When the Bible teaches us that we are to love one another, most people don't understand 
that there are really only two ways to love. We can either love with a worldly love or we can love with God's love. There is a big difference between the two. Worldly love is always about self. It is self-focused. It's how you make me feel. People often give the reason why they love someone because of the way he or she makes them feel. And even in family relationships that aren't marriage relationships or romantic relationships, boyfriend-girlfriend relationships, even in friendships, oftentimes it's what I can uh, get from this relationship with you that causes this love, this love to occur. That's worldly love. The world values people and things based on their usability. We see that across the board when we're out there in society. God's love, however, is always driven by a deep commitment toward others. It's always about the other person. What is in his or her best interest? How you can best serve them and what you can do for them. God's love always focuses on giving and serving, never on getting. And it's a selfless love that's motivated by a deep commitment to the other person, which means that it's always seeking the welfare of that other person. And we know that the uh, definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, it's written very clearly there. I'm not going to get into that this morning, but... In biblical context, the love that we're encouraged to love one another with counts as more significant um, when we look to others than ourselves. It's more significant that others understand that they are loved than it is to understand that we are loved. Now, God calls us to love sacrificially like Him. And also... Uh, in our love to him, love sacrificially to him, but also love sacrificially to the other people around us. For instance, in in Luke chapter 9, 23, Jesus said this, he said, then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That sounds like sacrificial love to God, right? Right? Take up your cross. We know what the cross represents. The cross represents death to self. So we die to our our own interests. We pick up our cross. Whoever wants to follow him must die to self-interest, pick up their cross, and follow. You see, on one occasion, Jesus decided to model true leadership to his disciples. And most of you who have read the New Testament have come across this story. And it's no secret that in the days of Christ in the Middle East, um, the climate is very hot and dry. So people wouldn't wear uh, shoes the same way that we wear shoes here in North America. Most people wore sandals, particularly in in those days. They wore sandals. And because all of the paths and the streets, for the most part, there is the Roman road that was made out of of, uh, stone, but for... For most of the trails and and roads, they were all dirt. They were all dust. So people wearing sandals with openness to to their feet would get their feet filled with dirt. So when they came into a house, they would always wash their feet before they came in. Otherwise, the house would be forever messy. So it was just a practice that they would wash their feet before they came into a house. And particularly if you're coming into a guest house, you, you wash your feet. Or actually, what would happen if you were in a higher class is the servant of the household would be the one who would be designated to wash the feet. It was a very dirty job. It was a low job. So they would wash people's feet as they came in if they were visiting to a house or if the, the, the lord of the house would come in, the servant would wash his feet. And this was part of the understanding. It's kind of foreign to us today, but that's how it worked in those days, in that culture. So in John chapter 13, we see Jesus taking on the role of a servant. And um, he got, his disciples were with him, and he 
got down on his hands and knees and he took a basin of water and he was going to wash his disciples' feet. And Peter, of course, he was always the one that was like, you know, yep, yep, yep. Peter was the talkative one, the extrovert among the bunch. He's like, no way, you're not going to wash my feet. I'm not going to let... And Jesus says, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part in me. <laughs> and Peter's like, oh, whoa, whoa, I didn't realize how important this is. Okay, Lord, then go ahead, wash my feet. Wash, wash me. Wash, wash me completely. Peter understood. And, and, and Jesus was making a point here. He was the Lord of the house, but he was taking on the role of a servant. the creator of the universe, the master, the one that they understood to be the Messiah, wash their feet? Wow. Jesus said in John 13, 13 to 15, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done for you. You see, my friends, serving one another in the church with selflessness is indeed the way of Christ. This is the way of the cross. This is discipleship. It is the way of love. So when you're focusing in on that, the selflessness and the servanthood that happens in Christian agape or God's love, having come to this conclusion, I had a thought about this, and I think we need to be very careful on this point. Because if we're not careful, our view of God's love can be distorted by looking at God's love solely as sacrificial. Now, I'm not saying that sacrificial love is not part of God's love. It certainly is. As what I explained here as in an, in an illustration with Christ giving himself selflessly to serve his disciples, that is part of God's love. But in the big picture of God, love that he intended us for to understand. I think we need to consider something further to that. Is sacrificial love all that there really is to this love of God? My friends, the truth is this. In proper perspective, and I'm going to say this, please don't get shocked with me as I know you're students of the scripture. I want you to search this out and see if what I'm saying is true. In its proper perspective, sacrificial love by itself is a dead end. Sacrificial love in itself is not the source. Consider this an illustration. If love is like a river that flows, sacrifice is the course that the river follows in this broken world. It's the course that it follows. But it is not the source. To follow the course of sacrificial love without recognizing its source leads to problems. What am I getting at? What are you getting at, Pastor Clint? Well, if we look at the love of God merely as just sacrifice and leave it there, That's going to lead us to certain things. If we separate it from its source, it's going to lead us to a martyrdom complex or selfish manipulation to accomplish something that we see where we give ourselves, we throw ourselves to the... Remember that scripture? Even if I surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I am nothing. What greater love would someone have have than if he lay down his life for his friends. But if he gives that sacrifice and lays down his life sacrificially without understanding the true nature of the love of God, it is meaningless. It's not, it, it, it misses the point. 
To view love as purely sacrificial as a goal or to practice in isolation will leave us with unfulfilled needs and a wrong view of who God is. Let me explain. If we come to believe that true life and ministry is supposed to be bearing with the things that we hate and enduring constant hardships in order to prove that we are actually loving God and other people? Did you hear that? Then we will actually view God as a person who is really that, not that interested in us or how we genuinely feel. You see, there's, there's a view of this that can be wrong, and, and so many Christians look like you've been sucking on limes or lemons. They're, they're, there's no joy in their life because they're, they're, they're living their lives as a, a funeral dirge, like I'm going to death. Therefore, I will serve to show my love, to prove my love for God. Who's in the driver's seat when we're like that? Is it God that's in the driver's seat or is it us? Am I saying that I have to work and sacrifice myself to be acceptable to God because that's how God expects things to work? Is that me maybe taking the driver's seat instead of the Lord? You see, when we begin seeing God as a demanding, sacrificial taskmaster instead of a father who cares for us deeply as his children, we're going to lose out on our joy for living and we're going to to develop excessive guilt for not being more sacrificially loving because there's never an end to that. We can never sacrifice enough to earn favor with God. It's not how it works. There There will not be satisfaction in that. That is, friends, this is, sal- this is salvation based on works, not on grace. Again, if the sacrificial aspect of God's love is not the source, but the course that love follows, then what, pray tell, is the source? The source. The source of the love of God is not the sacrificial element, which is part of the path of love, But at its core, God's love is domestic love. Domestic. And what do I mean by domestic? God's primary desire is that there be family closeness between Him and us and also between us and others. Family closeness. Please follow me with this thought. When Jesus was ministering on the earth, He prayed a prayer to the Father um, for His disciples. And this prayer is what John was referring to when he stated in verse 1 that that God has given us the message from the very beginning that we should love one another. So this prayer that Jesus prays is in, in sync with the first verse of our text today. And Jesus, what did Jesus say in his prayer just before he went to the cross? He prayed for his disciples and he also prayed for us because this wasn't just for his disciples. It was for all who would believe the message that they took out into the world. In John chapter 17, 20 to 24, Jesus said this. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. This message is directly spoken to us. Listen to this. That all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Do you see the implication of this? The Father loves the Son with more love than anyone can even describe. And that same love that the Father loves the Son with, the Father has for us as His children, that the Son has for us as the children. 
as the Spirit has for us as the children of God. God's love is manifest in the Trinity through the Father's love for Jesus. They are one. Jesus has given His disciples the glory that His Father has given to Him. What was that glory that the Father gave to the Son during His earthly ministry? A lot of people don't understand this. The Trinity worked in perfect harmony with the mission of Jesus. This is why when we start out when Jesus first started his ministry, when he started his earthly ministry, you know what the inception of that ministry was? When did Jesus start his ministry? At his baptism. And what happened at his baptism? When John plunged Jesus beneath the waters of baptism and he came up, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And the Father spoke out of heaven and said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. This is the start of the ministry of God. And then after his baptism, it continues. In Luke chapter 4, 1, Jesus, it says this, okay? Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So after spending time in the wilderness, fasting and praying for 40 days, we know that Jesus was tempted by the devil during his time of weakness. Sometimes we're tempted when we're weak. We're, we're, we're tempted. God allows us to be tempted and, and tested. Jesus overcame these temptations that were given to by Satan. And then it's written after his time in the desert, so his baptism to the desert, and after that time in Luke 4, 14 and 15, Jesus returned to Galilee. How? In the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching them in the synagogues and everyone praised him. You see, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit were acting together in perfect harmony through the earthly ministry of Jesus. And the character of this relationship is centered around God's love. God's love manifests, yes, as sacrificial love. How greater uh, of a love can we see manifested than what Jesus did for us on the cross? Philippians chapter 2 tells us about the servanthood of Jesus laying him down his life for us. But, God's love manifests as sacrificial love. But at its epicenter, at its start, is its relational closeness. You can't be any closer to someone than being at one with them. The Trinity of the Godhead always displays complete oneness. Always. Perfect unity. Perfection in love. And that's why the scriptures say that God is love. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. This, this is what it's talking about. It's relational closeness. And the, the source of it is in the Trinity. The source of it, of it is the love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the oneness that they are in. They are the embodiment of love. And this is why Jesus prayed to the Father to help the disciples become one relationally. He was praying for them to be close relationally. God's desire is that you and I as his children are close to one another. That we care deeply for one another. That it's not just a sacrifice that we do. I guess I have to. You get to serve in the church. Oh great, I guess I have to. You get to serve in your family. Uh -huh. No! I get to serve my family? Oh, I love them. I look into my grandchild's eyes. And I love my children very dearly as they were being raised. But I, I look into my grandfather's child, or my grandson's eyes. And the love that I have for him relationally, I just look at him. And he's so precious to me. He's only been around for seven months. But yet, I, I don't know how my heart could expand any further. It's so full. 
that, that love, that relational love. My grandson can't do anything outside of smile and giggle, maybe starting to say ga, ga, goo, goo, whatever. You might say mama and papa one of these days or something. I don't love him for what he offers me. I love him because he is. He is my son, my grandson. You know what I mean, if you're parents. If you're not a parent here yet, you will figure this out. It's hard for kids to understand how much their parents really love them. It really is. But when you become a parent and you look into the eyes of your first child, it all becomes real. So, and this is why Jesus prayed to the Father to help his disciples become one relationally, even as he would be one with them in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. I will never leave you or forsake you, says the Lord. I'll be with you to the end of the age. How is that possible? Because the Spirit of the living God is placed within the hearts of his children. And we are at one with him. We are atoned at one. Atonement, that's what atonement means. Made at one with God. Beautiful. And that's some very good news for us. And the same glory that descended upon Jesus is the same glory that descends upon us as his followers. Do you see the power of this? The same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead and seated Him at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms is the Spirit of God that lives within the heart of the true believer in Jesus Christ. My friend, you are loved. You are loved relationally. When God looks at you, He looks at you the same way that I look at my grandson. Only it's uh, far deeper than that because I can only love a certain level. But the infinite, all-powerful God lives, loves beyond anyone, how anyone could love. And that's why when you're in sync with the Holy Spirit, you love others just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So that center piece extends itself in the course of sacrificial giving. The glory of God is God's greatness, his honor, his beauty, his power, and his light. The glory of God is defined as, as that, you know, his greatness, his honor, his beauty, his power, his light. But most notably, it is manifest to all of his creation through his love. The truth is that the source of true love is the eternal love of God between Father, Son, and Spirit. That's the source. And therefore, God loves us a lot, doesn't he? That's a lot. We're talking infinite love. At the core of the love of God is this love for family, this unbreakable bond of affection, joy, and belonging. It is the love of devotion and delight, not of drudgery and slavery in the proper understanding of it. You know why Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light? Everyone serves a master. But when you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, he is a loving taskmaster. And his yoke is easy and his burden is light, unlike the devil, who is a harsh taskmaster, who is bent on stealing, killing, and destroying everything God has made good. That's his whole manifest. Hmm. So the love of God, love of devotion and delight, an eternal love without contract, without agreement, without strings attached, without bargaining or balancing. This is a love that is full, full of life and abundance. In Romans chapter 8, 14 to 17, the Apostle Paul says this, he says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba meaning Daddy. Daddy, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. 
if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we also may share in his glory. All the work that God calls us to in our lives, work in and through the church, should not find its source from sacrificial love as merely a duty. It should spring forth from family love. And that our hearts are full of care and compassion for the people sitting next to us. That we truly care about them. That we want to see what's best in their lives. Sometimes that love manifests itself in talking to someone straight. If someone's on a course that's leading to a destructive consequence, to love them enough to take them by the hand and say, or the shoulder or whatever, and say, hey, man, you may not see this, but you're, what you're doing here might not be good for you. I, I would counsel you just to turn around, turn away from that, and go the right way. You see, sometimes love offers a rebuke. And when you love someone in that way, you're risking that they're going to have, want nothing to do with you anymore. And indeed, they might not. But if you truly love them, you'll be honest. I just said that for... Because that's part of love. It's only where this family love and our broken world collide that we need this demonstration of sacrificial love. But when we stay true to understanding the source of love being God's family love for us. <laughs> Our journey no longer is going to be a heavy burden. Why? Because we understand that what we do has eternal benefit for others. And that actually, that actually sacrificial love might in actuality turn to joy in the morning. The Apostle John continues in verse 12 where he instructs the church as a warning some, uh, somehow, I think, as to emphasize this correct understanding of our relationship with God and our brothers and sisters. Now, he says this. He says, Don't be like Cain. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. See, that fits right in line with what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you here. You see, Cain approached God out of sense of duty, but his heart was far away from the Lord, and his love for God was actually worldly love. He was loving God with selfish motivation, thinking that he would receive a blessing. He was approaching the throne of God and giving a sacrifice to God for what he could get out of the deal. That's what Cain's heart was like. It was not springing from a love of family love, like Abba, father love. It was like if I do this, then I will receive this as a result. And what happened when God saw through all of that and saw his heart for what it was and how his heart was not surrendered to the Lord, his heart was proud, God rejected his sacrifice. And immediately we see that Cain, yes, this was the source of love. It was a worldly thing for him because when God said, I don't accept this sacrifice, what did he do? He looked at Abel the one whose sacrifice was acceptable to God because his heart was right with God. He looked at Abel and he hated him for it. This shows the stem, the root of Cain's heart. It wasn't of God. And this is why John says that his heart was given over to the evil one. And Cain murdered his brother Abel because of his jealousy because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. <laughs> so, the apostle warns us not to be like Cain, who became jealous of a brother for receiving favor from God, for receiving God's blessing. Genesis 4.9, we read, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know. He replied, am I my brother's keeper? See the heart of Cain? Even when God said, hey, where's your brother? He knew exactly what Cain had done. He was asking Cain to confess. And Cain says, I live my own life. What, could, what should I care about the guy next to me, my brother? Am I his keeper? I do what I please. He does what he pleases. And that's good enough, isn't it? Hey, folks, lest we forget 
this is an example in Scripture because the heart of man is desperately wicked and prone to wander from the living God. And when our heart is not in line, in sync with the Holy Spirit, we will look at our brethren in the assembly, our people in our family with that same disdain. We will look at them as competitors with us rather than wanting to give ourselves for their sake. Rather than caring about them, we will look at them as though they are our competition. Am I my brother's keeper? Which, why should I be concerned about him? That's essentially what he's saying. Why should I be concerned about him? That is not of the Lord. If our, in our hearts we look around at our brethren and we say, why should I be concerned about him? Ooh. Stop. If I have a heart response to people around me in my church or in my family like that, I need to repent and say, God, have mercy on me. Huh? I'm sorry, Lord, when I come with my agenda. I'm sorry, Lord, when I just try to advance myself over, over others. Oh, then John moves on. He says, Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. So talking about Cain and Abel. If we really don't love our brothers... If we don't love our brothers, we have to ask ourselves whether we've actually given ourselves over to Christ. If I hate my brothers, and I'm in competition with everyone around me, and my heart is always bent that way, then I have to ask myself whether my relational connection with God has actually been established. This is a time for sober reflection. I'm not saying this is you. I don't know where your heart is. God knows where your heart is. But if you have a heart like Cain's, there needs to be a repentance. There needs to be, God, forgive me. Because my heart is going to breed hatred. And hatred's going to breed what? Division. And division breeds what? Brokenness. And it, it takes away from the missionary influence of the church. It taints the it taints the testimony of the local church in the world. If I hate my brethren, if I'm at odds against them, if I'm in competition with them, then the whole world is going to look at that and they're going to go, if that's Christianity, I want nothing to do with it. If that's what it's like, I got no time for that at all. And indeed, they shouldn't have time for that because that's not truly faith in Christ. Faith is in Christ Truth in the gospel is always focused around the love of God for, for us and him and the love of God for us to one another. Verse 14 of our text. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. You hear that? Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. God desires us as his children to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we will have the heart of Abel, not the heart of Cain that is natural to us when we're born. As it's written in Romans 12 too, friends, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Becoming a Christian really is, is nothing less than a quickening or a resurrection out of spiritual death into spiritual life. And a Christian lifestyle can be summed up in one word. Love. Love. Because love affects everything. It affects, even affects discipline. It affects our, our sense of justice. It is at the epicenter of the Christian walk. The love that is rooted in God's love is more than just words or feelings. It is more than just words or feelings. The love that God puts in our hearts affects everything. It affects our pockets, our possessions, our priorities, where and how we spend our time. John continues in verse 16 saying, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. What does that mean? <laughs> this is deep stuff, right? 
People say, oh, pastor, you're preaching the, the, the uh, how would you say it? You're preaching the milk of the word. Uh-uh, no, 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 no. This is the meat of the word, folks. This is the meat and potatoes of everything. This is where we go deep with God. This is where we go deep. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. You see, true love for God is not only revealed in supreme sacrifices that we might be called upon to offer. Maybe one of us will be called to offer our lives in, instead of another's. You know, I've heard stories of Christians showing great acts of heroism, running into burning buildings and cars, grabbing people and pulling them out, knowing that they well could die as a result of that. Not only Christians, but, but Christian brethren, knowing full well that they may be going to their death to sacrifice their life so that someone else could live. We may be called on that, but that's not all it's talking about here. Not many of us are going to be called to some sacrificial heroism like that. We may be, but not many of us will. But God has much to say about charitable and benevolent giving of ourselves to others in everyday living as, as Christians, as, as His children. There's no higher proof of the family love of God at work and how well we support the charitable and benevolent causes in the body of Christ. I'm going to say it again. Our wallets will follow our hearts. If we see out there needs where people are hurting, where people are starving, where people are struggling and we don't meet that need and we have the capability of meeting it, then we're not acting in the love that God's talking about as family love. The Holy Spirit's presence within us is more than just the moving of miraculous work. I believe in the miraculous moving of the Spirit for today. I believe in that. God still heals today. I've been healed God still speaks to us today. Relevant, practical, prophetic. He speaks to us today. Sometimes God will say, hey, there's something that's happening over here and this is what it is. And you go and you speak to it and for sure, how did you know that? Well, I didn't know that. The Holy Spirit knew that. And the Holy Spirit's speaking through me. But even if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love. I am nothing but a clanging gong, a symbol that goes crashing symbol. If I have not love. You see, the Holy Spirit's presence within us is more than just the moving of a miraculous work, although it includes that. It is also displayed in the fruit of the Spirit consisting of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. That should be flowing out of us like a river. That is the mark of the Holy Spirit's presence within us. What I'm saying is, folks, this isn't religion. This is all about relationships and relationship between us and God and us and our brothers and sisters in Christ and the work of Christ here in the earth so that the world may know that he is who he says he is so that the gospel, the good news of Jesus could be effective and productive in our society and across this globe. God help us to be a giving and ascending church, a heart that is filled with compassion for the widows and the orphans, that has more concern about the manifest presence of God in and through our lives than what I can get out of the deal. That's God's love at the core. Family love. Oh God, renew our first love. Help us to come back to our first love. Scripture is very clear. If a church gets cold in the love of God, guess what? The candlestick of that church will be removed. You want to see a church die? You watch a church that abandons love in God's definition. That church will die. 
God will remove the candlestick from its place. Revelation talks about that. Revelation chapter, I can't remember if it's in two or three. But the message to that church in Smyrna. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything that we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. Oh, man. Oh, you know, it's so good. It's so good to have assurance and confidence in the Lord, isn't it? If you had that in your heart, it is so good. There is a peace about that that surpasses understanding that guards our hearts and our minds in Him. The blessing that comes from an uncondemned heart is more than just peace, though. But it is the blessing of the blessing of God is uninterrupted communion with God. It's not just peace, but uninterrupted communion. You see, the person that gets this and submits fully to the love of God, you know, we're always growing in that. I shouldn't say fully. We're always going to grow in that. But in this place, I open up my heart to you, Lord. Have your way in me. Take my life. Make it whatever you want it to be. That kind of heart. That kind of heart will be in tune with God. And when you are called to pray for something, you will know because the Spirit will share His thoughts with you. You will know what you should pray for and then your prayers will be effective and you will receive what you ask because you'll have the discernment to know that God is calling you to pray this way. Does that make sense? There's a guy named Pastor David Guzik. He authors um, Enduring Word Bible Commentary, and he puts it this way. The person who walks in the kind of obedience and love John speaks of will also experience answered prayer. This is not just because their love and obedience has earned them what they ask, but their love and obedience comes from fellowship. The key to answered prayer. Closeness with God. When we walk close with God, we hear from Him. If our hearts are dulled to the voice of God in our lives, chances are that we need to ask him to remove the clutter and draw me near. Draw me near. Draw me near, precious Lord. Draw me near. Do you hear the call of John? When he says, beloved, let us love one another. When he says, this is what you should know from the beginning. This is what you've been told from beginning to love one another. And this is his command, in closing, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it, how? By the spirit he gave us. Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? Dan, would you come forward? Jesus, we thank you. We glorify your name. We ask, Lord, that you would be glorified in and through your body. Forgive us, Lord, for the times where we sidestep your agenda and we rush to our own. God, would you take our lives, would you take my life, Lord, and make it pleasing to you because I love you, Lord. For no other reason, Lord, not what I can get out of this deal, but simply because you are worthy and because I want to please you because you're my daddy. Father, we thank you for this love that you've given to us first. You first loved us so that now we could love you and love one another richly. Help us, Lord, to love each other with the love that you've given us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.